The second one that I want to look at today of three is in Isaiah 55. Again, very familiar passage. And in, in the kind of the narrative flow, you've got Isaiah 52 and 53, which is the suffering servant, you know, the, who, who gives up his life to redeem many, this picture of the cross. And then you get chapter 54, chapter 55, coming out of that, really. So this picture of life. And then in chapter 55, it all comes out of the, the cross moment and the sacrifice of Christ. Isaiah 55, really what we see here is a, a picture of God as the speaker of a word, but also as the spoken word. So God as speaker and as spoken. And verse 10, very familiar verses. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. So right now, if you've just received a prophetic word or felt God speak to you, you've got to hold on to things like this. You know, God says, if I say something, it will happen. It will produce fruit in your life. The words of God are powerful and effective. They possess intrinsic life and intrinsic power. At the beginning, God said, let there be light and light happened. That's amazing. Imagine, it just, you know, just imagine being able to say, let there be steak. <laughs> like, Dan's there. You know. But like, the ability to create with your words, that's unique to God. It's incredible. So he can speak something over your life, you know, let you be a missionary to Jamaica. Hallelujah. You know, but then... And, and God can make it happen. If he says it, he can, he can take even stubborn material like you and make you into what he wants. It's incredible. And Jesus, remember, is the word of God. Word become flesh. So Jesus is a word spoken from God who becomes flesh and achieves what he wants to achieve. So he's, he was spoken by God to achieve salvation in the earth and he achieves that. So the, the words of God are unstoppable. You know, a wall doesn't stop words. Armies can't stop words. Yeah, it's an incredible picture because the word has such power and such permanence. And the picture here is just like snow comes down and makes stuff happen in the earth, and just like rain comes down and makes stuff happen in the earth, so my word will make stuff happen in the earth. Now, the incredible thing about that is both the irresistibility of it, but also the fact that snow, if it's going to produce life, it falls down, but then it's got to melt, and the water's got to get absorbed into the soil, and then it produces life. And water, when rain, when it comes down, it's got to be absorbed. It's got to go down into the earth in order to produce fruit. So they've both got to kind of die in order to produce fruit. They've got to lose their life lose their form in order to produce life in order to give life and that's what Jesus does he comes down from heaven like snow but he's got to go down into the ground in death and burial in order to produce fruit in order to produce life and that's so often true isn't it when the word of God comes to us it's kind of got to be buried in our heart for a while and sometimes it feels like that word's died you know when I was 19 God spoke to me and said when you're 30 you're going to go to Asia and um, that word had to die for 11 years. And then when I turned 30, we'd move to Istanbul. You know, but it's kind of, the word comes and it's got to be buried and died in order to produce life because it's got to get deep inside. And so if God's spoken something to you and it feels buried and dead at the moment, know that actually what it's doing is it's germinating deep inside so that it can produce life, just like snow has to melt. And... Um, but also, when we talk about the Word of God coming from God, we're talking about the Bible, aren't we? That we consider the Bible to be Word from God as well. And um, what you've got to know about the Bible is that it has a power to change lives on its own. It doesn't need you to pretty it up or to make it more comprehensible or to um, 
use little preacher gimmicks to make things land, you know, particularly cross-culturally, which is why we talk so much about kind of Bible storying and letting the, the story do its work. So when I was in Athens a couple of weeks ago with Jonathan and Sarah, they were doing uh, a Discovery Bible study group with a, a, a whole group of Iranian refugees in a little cafe in the middle of Athens. And if, I don't know if you're familiar with the Discovery Bible study format, but essentially, Jonathan tells a story from the Bible and then says, who wants to repeat the story? So no adulteration, no color, just tells the story. So one of the Iranian guys, because Iranians have an incredible memory for story, repeats the story word for word from the Bible. And then Jonathan goes to everyone else around the table. Did he miss anything? Is there anything, you know, did you hear anything that didn't get said or whatever? So a few people chip a few things in. And then you just ask these four questions. So what does this story tell you about God? Amazing, really simple. Secondly, what does this story tell you about mankind? Um, thirdly, what does this story, what, what is the one thing from this story that you feel God might be saying to you? Like what's the one thing that you need to take away? And then fourthly, who else can you share this story with this week? Who can you go and tell, the, who needs to hear this story? You know, so really simple, but it's the power in all its unadulterated form of the Bible. And just trust the Bible. And here's just a couple of great missionary scriptures about, about this that bring great encouragement. Uh, James 1 and 21. It's worth memorizing, great verse. Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So in other words, clear some of the bushes and stuff away from your heart. Let the word of God be implanted in your heart because it is able to save. So it's got power to change lives. And then this one from Acts chapter 20, um, which is Paul meeting with the Ephesian elders on the beach before he goes. And he says to them a couple of things. He says, number one, I'm never coming back. You're on your own now. We've planted the church. I've gone... Sort it out between yourselves. But number two, he says, but also when I go, uh, vicious wolves are going to come in and like destroy the flock. So they're going, well, then don't leave, Paul. We need you, you know. Uh, But Paul says, you're going to be okay because you've got the Bible. (laughs) So he says this, he says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to the flock in which the Holy Spirit's made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, will arise men of twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish every one of you with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, okay, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So he says, what we're leaving you with is God but also the word of his grace, the gospel that's been planted in you, which is able to build you up. So in other words, this word of grace that's planted in you, I'm off, it's able to build this church and to give you the inheritance among all those that are satisfied, to achieve everything that God wants. So the, the word of God, the, the gospel that comes into people's lives is really powerful. We can go plant churches, leave again, and trust that it's going to work and it's going to produce stuff in people's lives. Amen?